All right, thank you everybody for coming. I want to thank everybody who uh, organized DevConf for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. My name is Jeff Wall. Um, <clears throat> I work on the clinical solutions management. I delivered babies for 22 years before I came to work at Cerner about five years ago. And we're going to talk about kind of a weird combination of things. I didn't know what to call it, so I called it scrambled eggs. There's a Beatles reference in there. Five bucks to the first person at the end who can tell me what the reference is. Um, but I want to give you just kind of a little brief history of the U.S. healthcare system, the way the medical profession, specifically doctors, the way we fit into it now, what we're thinking, and then your role in it at the end. Doctors really don't like EMRs. If you look at the, these are headlines I just pulled off the web in about five minutes. Primitive and asinine, what doc, real doctors think of the EMR. Feds move into digital medicine, Fe doc face doctors backlash. Nine reasons doctors hate their EMR. Most physicians can't get no EHR satisfaction. We really aren't happy with what's going on in medicine. But to, under to understand that, to understand what's wrong with US healthcare and why this transition has been so hard, we really need to go back to kind of the beginning of the US healthcare system. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna do a little history tour. The, the European healthcare system through the 1700s and 1800s was actually pretty well developed. It was well funded, they had sta uh, stabilized societies, they had employed doctors, things were getting better in Europe through the 1700s and 1800s, but the US was a brand new country. We were expanding west and literally medicine before about the 1890s in the US was just awful, completely unregulated, terrible, anything goes, patent medicine, snake oil, you name it, that's what U.S. medicine was like. People didn't go to the hospital to get better, people went to the hospital to die. It was a place for custodial care. Almost all health care actually took place in the home. You're less likely to die there. However, by about 1890s, a lot of the developments that were going on in Europe are starting to filter back to the U.S it's starting to get better, but it's still not great. So the AMA in 1910 commissioned a guy named Abraham Flexner to go out and just kind of figure out what's going on, specifically focus on the U.S. healthcare education system. And he went out and he visited every single medical school in the United States and Canada, and he came back and he filed what's called the Flexner Report. And what he basically found was is that the quality of medical education in the United States was really, really bad. There were way too many medical schools. None of them were accredited. They're cranking out doctors with six months of training. No, there were no state um, regulatory bodies. There's nothing. You couldn't count on the quality. If somebody went to Johns Hopkins, you got a good doc. But they also could have gone to some little school that they got off the back, literally got off the back of a matchbook. So the AMA and the government looked at it and said, well, we got to fix that. So they, they went out and they shut down over half the medical schools in the U.S. They restricted the number of people who could actually graduate from medical school. That actually did a disservice to women because there were a lot of women in medical school before this happened. Um, shut pushed women back about 70, 80 years in medicine because they just said, all right, we'll stop taking women. States started licensing doctors. Medical schools needed to be accredited, and we settled on the Johns Hopkins system of medicine, which is four years of college, four years of med school, and anywhere from three to seven years of training after that. And it worked. Medicine got better. By the 1920s, U.S. healthcare had pretty much caught up with the rest of the world. We're doing good. But then the Depression hit. Worst economic downturn in the history of the world. Baylor Hospital, Baylor University Hospital down in Dallas, Texas, is in trouble. If you got a hospital, the way you make money is you got people in hospital. You got bodies in beds. They're, 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 they're not filling their hospital, they're not making money. People aren't actually going to the hospital because they can't afford to pay it. This is the cash days. They're not going to the doctor, they can't afford to pay. So what Baylor did was that they went to the Dallas School Teachers Union and they said for $6, we will guarantee every single one of your school teachers 21 days in the hospital. Now, people had played around and thought about health care insurance prior to that, but nobody could actually think of a model that made it work because the people who would buy insurance would typically be the people who'd end up using it, and they'd have the insurance companies have to pay. You get health insurance because you knew you were sick, and if you got sick, then they had to pay. They wouldn't do it. 
But what, what Baylor figured out in the Dallas School Teachers Union, they figured out was it's a way to spread the cost of health care across a young, healthy population. And the model worked. You see now the beginnings, one of the first key events in U.S. healthcare history. You see the beginning of the U.S. healthcare insurance industry. That continues to grow. Other hospitals start paying attention. 1939, a lot of these hospital organizations come together and they form Blue Cross. The doctors, not wanting to be left out of the insurance business, said, wow, the hospitals are actually doing pretty good. <laughs> They're doing really good over here. They're insuring people and all that. So the doctors and the medical societies get together and they form something called Blue Shield. So now we have a system for paying for hospital care as well as outpatient doctor care. And that's right there. You see kind of the solidification of health care insurance in the U.S. However, 1942 comes along. We're right in the middle of World War II. What happened in World War II was you had this huge chunk of the population who was doing a lot of the labor get shipped overseas. The workforce left in the U.S. is now in demand. Wages start to go up. Congress looks at it and says, this is getting out of control. So they passed the, the uh, Stabilization Act of 1942. And basically what they did was they said, nobody's getting a raise. Not one person in the U.S. is going to get a raise until this whole war is over. Nobody. We're just stabilizing it. This, this whole wage problem is getting out of control. But Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, looked at it and he said, yeah, but, you know, these companies, they want to attract the best people. How are we going to do that? So he put a proviso into the Stabilization Act that said that employers could offer tax-free health care insurance to their employees. So now the employers have a way to attract the best employees, to reward their best employees. I can't give you a raise, but here's what I can do. I can give you tax-free health care insurance. And another seminal event happens in the history of U.S. health care. You start to see now the coupling of the insurance industry to the employment, to your employers. The war eventually ends. People come back from war. They get busy working. They get busy in the bedroom. This thing called the baby boom happens. We start looking at how many hospitals there are across the U.S. And they, we, they really notice that we're missing. I mean, there's huge areas of the U.S. which are underserved by hospitals. So Congress passes the Hill-Burton Act. In the Hill-Burton Act, they had this big pot of money, and they said, let's go out and build some hospitals. And over one-third of all hospitals built since 1942 were funded by the Hill-Burton Act. So another seminal event in U.S. healthcare history happens, because when you build hospitals, people want to use hospitals. Hospitals make money by having bodies in the hospital. The way you attract people to come to your hospital is you start bringing in the specialists. And the specialists tend to do the expensive, really kind of, you know, the intensive care but now we see a shift, because medicine was primarily focused on the general practitioner out in the community. But with the Hilburton Act and all these hospitals being built, we now see medicine starting to focus in on the hospital and the specialist. So, after World War II, through the rest of the 40s through the 50s, commercial insurance gets in on it. People have good insurance unless you're old. Because what happened is, is now the government has eventually mandated that all employers have to provide health care insurance. So they do. So as long as you're employed, you've got great, great health care insurance. When you retire, you lose your job. You don't have any more health care insurance. That left a whole segment of the population, the segment that's most likely to need health care, completely uncovered. The elderly. Congress looks at that and said, well, we've got to cover it. Doctors don't want to take care of those patients because they're on a fixed income. They can't pay. Hospitals don't want them because they don't have any money to pay. We're not doing the right things. Medicare's passed. And Medicare, they basically looked at it and said, here's what we'll do. We're going to pay doctors and hospitals to take care of the elderly. Every single person, when they retire at age 65, can have Medicare insurance. And to make sure that the doctors and the nurses or in the hospitals take those people for insurance, we're going to pay better than insurance we're actually going to pay more money. Well, the hospitals and doctors, they paid attention. They loved it. This is the golden age of medicine. Minting money throughout the 70s. Everybody's making a ton of money. But what became obvious by about the about 1980s, early 1980s, is this is out of freaking control. 
Healthcare costs are skyrocketing. They're going up because now we've got all these hospitals, all this specialist care. It's going up because Medicare is just minting money. Nobody's paying attention. So the government puts together a plan called the DRGs, Diagnosis-Related Groups. Basically what that means is that every time somebody came into the hospital, there's a flat fee for whatever their diagnosis was. Came in for an appendicitis, government said, here's what we're going to pay for appendicitis. It's all you're going to get. You can't just bill us for everything willy-nilly, hospital. This is what you're going to get for appendicitis. Come in for heart attack, this is what you're going to get for heart attack. And the idea was is that if, we, if the government can put these financial constraints on the hospital, the hospitals would put constraints on me to practice better medicine. The goal was is how do we keep this thing from spiraling out of control. The key thing on the DRG zone, was a, this is probably the most important event in the past 30 years, is it, it was shift in the power in, the med in medicine, a shift away from the providers of care, the hospital of doctors, and towards the payers for, of care, the government and the insurance companies. So let's stop there. This is a cheetah. Lithe, supple, camouflaged, it's a pinnacle predator. If you're trotting across the Serengeti and you see one of the things barreling down on you, which you probably won't, but if you do, make your peace with God, you're what's for dinner, <laughs> right? Evolution created this as the ultimate killing machine. This is a platypus. It has beaver's tail, venomous ankle spurs, mammal's fur, it is a mammal, it has webbed feet, it has an electroreceptor duck's bill, it lays eggs, but it breastfeeds. Evolution created this hot mess also. <laughs> and if you don't believe in evolution, then God was drinking at 11.45 Saturday night when he put this one together. <laughs> this is the U.S. healthcare system. No one in their right mind would design a system that follows this pattern. It's crazy. We've got a platypus, not a cheetah. And the platypus has continued to evolve through the years. It's become increasingly regulated. The U.S. healthcare system was essentially unregulated before about 1983 when people started paying attention. OSHA, CLIA, NCQA, all these other different, you know, private and public payers all coming and starting to tell the doctors how I'm supposed to do my job. Tell me how I'm supposed to get paid. In the AMA, which is supposed to be our watchdog, only a quarter of doctors belong to that. They can't actually represent our needs. Three quarters of us don't think they think like it. I love this one down here, the IAMRA, International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities. It's a, it's a medical regulatory authority to regulate the medical regulatory authorities. <laughs> and all this happened kind of incrementally and kind of slowly. In the docs, we always took the high ground. I'm a doctor. I take care of patients. Somebody else just do all this other stuff. And they did. And usually those people were nurses, politicians, hospital administrators. And while we weren't paying attention, my profession wasn't paying attention, they were. And they were instituting changes that directly affected me, but I got my head over here buried in the sand. I'm not paying attention. In the early 90s, Bill and Hillary tried to, um, tried to institute national health care, failed miserably. I think it might have worked if Bill hadn't put Hillary in. She was just kind of politically divisive, still is. <laughs> Hillary and, and, you know, Donald. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll see how that's going to work out. Um, but we, and, we as doctors, we, we got really upset about what they were planning. We got worried, but, you know, it got squashed. Politics squashed it, and we felt good, and we went back to burying our heads in the sand. But those people who were trying to do all this stuff continue thinking. Fifteen years later, all that got hardened into the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. And Obamacare isn't just about getting everybody in the U.S. insured. The Obamacare is also about changing models of practice and payment models. Changing, critically changing the way we practice medicine, patient-centered medical home, accountable care organization, and the way we get paid. MIPS, MACRA, that kind of thing. You mess with somebody's paycheck and the way they do their job, they get irritated. 
So, RAND study. RAND, anybody know what the RAND study is? We all benefit from the RAND study, the first RAND study. The first RAND study, 2005. They say they went out and they said, effective EMR implementation could eventually save more than $81 billion annually by improving healthcare efficiency and safety. We can't do this thing if people stay on a paper system. It's just too hard. It's too distributed. It's too unregulated. It's too inefficient. And if we're going to change this thing and make it better, got to get people using computers. George Bush, right on board with that. Within 10 years, Americans must have a personal electronic medical record. Thank you, George. Barack Obama, 2009, to improve, or 2005, I think, 2009, to improve the quality of health care. We're going to ensure that within five years, every American's medical records are computerized. Make good on his promise. 2009 is part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to bring us out of the economic, latest economic downturn. We had the High Tech Act. And the High Tech Act basically encouraged EMR adoption. Some would say forced EMR adoption. And basically what they said is, doctors and hospitals, you got four years to get on an EMR. You got four years to start doing all your work on a computer. If you do it in the first four years, we'll reward you. We got a $35 billion pot here. Every doctor you do it, you can get up to $18,000 a year for doing your work on the EMR. If your hospital's starting at $2 billion, depending on how big you are, we're going to give you money. We're going to help you subsidize you. We're going to reimburse you for doing it. If you don't do it in four years, well, you're going to take it in the shorts. We're going to fine you 1% of your Medicare reimbursements in Medicaid the first year, 2% the next year, 3%. If you're a hospital and you make most of your money off of Medicare and Medicaid, 1% is a lot. She brought in that whole era of meaningful use. You've probably heard about meaningful use. So there's two things. You had to show that you were meaningfully using the EMR in your practice. You also had to show that you're, doing, you're improving quality. So you couldn't just buy an EMR somewhere, some get some cheap thing, something open source or whatever, install it on a computer, stick it in the back room and never turn it on and say, oh yeah, I got an EMR. You actually had to prove you're using it. You have to prove it. So there's a whole series of measures and hoops and things you gotta do if you're a practice or a hospital to prove that your people are using it. And the doctors hated it. They said, I went to medical school to take care of patients. I don't wanna be a transcriptionist. I don't wanna be a clerk. Back to the headlines. In retrospect, meaning, meaning, meaningless use, meaningful use was meaningless. The sad, tragic road to meaningful use. Doctors say meaningful use penalties and incentives are meaningless. Physicians, we hear you, it's not meaningful. Meaningful use is meaningless to my patients. Meaningful use is more like meaningless tasks. That bugs you. You're rocking through 40 patients a day trying to make a living and all of a sudden you gotta do all this busy work. We've added a minute or two minutes We've added a couple hours to your day. That's irritating. This is a great quote, Aaron Carroll. He's actually very pro EMR, but he summed it up really well. EMR systems are hard to use, difficult to maintain. They disrupt clinical practice. They don't increase efficiency. They don't pay for themselves. They disrupt the doctor-patient relationship, and they're very, very, very expensive. We don't like them. Second part of High Tech Act was you had to show not only that you were using the, the EMR in a meaningful way, you're not just shifting your work from paper to a computer, you're actually using what you're doing on the computer now to improve the quality of the care that you're providing. But let's put that in perspective. So in 1999, the Institute of Medicine released a report called To Air as Human. It's the first time anybody actually looked at, at the systematically at the number of medical errors in the US. And what they found was up to 98,000 people every year died for medical mistakes. Almost $100,000, 100,000 100, people died every year because somebody screwed up in medicine. Wow, nobody had ever looked at that before. Set out a call to arms, we need to pay attention to the quality. Okay, so, 1660s in England, two thirds of all children died before the age of four. So if you're sitting out at the audience, in the audience, Look at the two people on each side of you. They shouldn't be here. Two thirds of kids died before the age of four. Risk of death from childbirth in the USA in 1901 and 11. I'm on my first wife, thank God. 1900, I'd probably be on my second or third. 
by now. <laughs> Risk of death from childbirth in 2010, 11 in 100,000. That even seems a little high to me. We never see women die as a result of childbirth in the United States anymore. Average lifespan in the United States, 1945. Average lifespan in 2000, and we're holding firm since 2000 at 78.5. It's actually four years younger than Europe and Western, Western Europe and France. They all, the French live to, on average, about 82.5. We're eating too many freedom fries here in the United States, I'm guessing, <laughs> is what it is. If you don't believe those numbers, my wife and I were in Scotland, St. Andrews, and we saw this tombstone. This poor sap, David Roger, a candle maker, lost his wife, age 40, Jean, age 3, Janet, age 2, William, age 15 months, Catherine, age 4 months. He lost his whole family in the space of five years. Tragic. And there's nothing different about him and his family than now. Human evolution doesn't move that fast. Genetically, we're the same. We've just gotten pretty good at what we do. People back then, back then died of things that we fixed. Clean water got rid of cholera, typhoid, and typhus. Antibiotics got rid of things that used to kill kids like ear infections and dental abscess, all that stuff. We've gotten pretty good at what we do. So it begs the question, are we bad or are we good? Are we, doctor, you're killing 98 thousand people. Actually, they just came out recently said it, it's probably somewhere between 98 and 255,000 people per year and, and medical mistakes are the number three cause, the third highest cause of death in hospitals. So are we killing up to 100,000 more people every year or the doctor standing there going, are you kidding me? We're saving millions. We're saving millions of people. This whole, this whole auditorium is full instead of being a third, two, third is full. Medicine's under pressure, Incre increasingly regulated, meaningless use, it's like the doctors like to call it, accountable for the quality of the care, can't just see you as a patient and bill you for it, <laughs> actually, God, you got to get better, you're, gonna, you're not going to pay us as much if you don't get better, revenue's at risk, the baby boom happened, so everybody's getting old, which just means we're all going to get busier, that's a new normal that we live in, that's the normal of today's medical profession. So what you've got is a bunch of people who are completely disenfranchised. We've lost control. We've lost control of medicine. It went with the DRGs. We buried our head in the sand. It's gone. We weren't at the table when it was happening. We whine. We complain about it. It's our own fault. We didn't show up. Disenfranchised. We're disgruntled because you're screwing around with our paycheck. And I think anybody who gets their paycheck messed around with is disgruntled. And we're dismayed because they're telling us you're killing 100,000 and we're sitting there going, yeah, but we're saving millions. You got a group of people who ends up just being a royal pain in the wazoo. And if you've been on an ACE, you've been out on the client side, you've probably run into some doctor having a complete meltdown as they're standing on the edge of that precipice of the EMR, <laughs> typically an orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> and they're yelling at you, or you've been to the doctor's office and you tell them, they ask you, hey, so who do you work for, sir? Oh. <laughs> right? Yeah, they actually don't get to your sore throat for another hour. As they kind of go through this litany of chronically dissatisfied group of folks. We have to get the hearts and minds of our physicians back. I think we lost them. Thank you, Andy Slavitt. Thank you, Captain Obvious. No, duh. <laughs> right? But this whole thing's about better care and lower cost. Because despite the fact that we do save millions of people every year, there's somewhere between 100,000 and 255,000 people who are dying because of medical mistakes. We have to provide better care to them. We can't just say, yeah, well, that's just the odds. Not good enough. One of those people is your family member. It's important. And we've got to do it cheaper. The U.S. spends twice as much as the rest of the world. The average per capita cost of health care in the U.S. is $8,000 per year. The rest of the world tops out around 4000 Yet we are not in the top 20 for health care. The French, who spend exactly 
half of what we do with four years longer. We have to figure out how to do better care at lower cost. It's important. The RAND study showed that healthcare IT is really the foundation for doing that. Paper systems are just too inefficient. We can't audit the way people practice. We can't report on the way people practice. We can't figure out what we're actually paying unless everybody's doing their work in some type of digital format. We at Cerner sit at the junction between healthcare and information technology. We are the foundation of the change that's happening in U.S. healthcare. Let's go back to the literature. Doctors love literature. We always Give me the evidence. So, Jamie, Journal of the American Medical Information Association. Is it working? 2004. Not so much. Actual improvements in medical outcomes have not been documented. It could actually increase the number of adverse drug events. Wow. EMR was not working there. Cedar sinai tried to put in their own EMR back in 2005. It was clunky and slow. The doctors weren't trained on it. It's insufficient. Electronic health record implementation is risky. That's a really strong statement. This one from the Journal of Pediatrics. Unexpected increase in mortality after implementation of an EMR. Wow, that was actually Cerner. That was us. This one, fortunately, was epic. An error in weight-based dosing allowed a doctor to order a dosage of medicine that was 38 and a half times what it should have been. The nurse, thinking, well, it came through the EMR, they've got these alerts built into it that it's got to be right, gave the kid 38 and a half pills. Fortunately, the kid lived. Huge error. It's not looking very good. That was 2013. That's fairly recently. Let's look at RAND study number two, because the RAND Corporation went back and looked at it again, 2013. And what they found was is there is disappointing performance of HIT, and it's due to three things. The first, sluggish adoption of health IT systems. Hospitals are just dragging their feet doing this. Anybody here work for AMS? You probably know that. If you've been in consulting, you probably know that. Systems that aren't interoperable and they're not easy to use. Wow. If it was bad on the hospital, number one, bad on us is an industry. I know we're working on it, bad on us. And then the last one, failure of healthcare providers to re-engineer the care process because it's different. You can't just take a paper process and do it on a computer. Failure of the doctors and the nurses to show up at the table, Cedar sinai proved that, in re and building a system that actually works. So bad on the hospitals, bad on the industry, bad on the medical providers. Everybody's failing. But it's 2016, so where are we now? So I went back and I looked through the literature again. Is it still bad? Are we getting better? What's going on? So unfortunately, there's still work to do. High variability in ordering approaches between different EMRs, major deficiencies. However, standardizing best practice works. Evidence-based EMR ordering practices, potential to improve pneumonia and other outcomes by standardizing care across the hospitals, across the medical practices by removing variants. That's good. Less waste. Implementing a multifaceted electronic approach led to a significant reduction in wastage of red blood cells, platelets, and cryoprecipitate. You don't want to waste that stuff. Somebody took time out of their day to go to the blood bank and have a really big needle jammed into their arm so we could suck blood out of them. We want to save that. We don't want to waste that if we don't have to. Right medicine at the right time. After implementation of CPOE, patients got their postoperative analgesia faster, had less pain, required less medication. Didn't have to ring the call bell and wait an hour for the nurse to show up and then another hour for her to get the pill hooked up to the system already. Better care for older patients. Prescribing rates for drugs with the least efficacy and potential for harm could be modified with CPOE. Those alerts that annoy everybody so much, they actually did a good thing here. They helped us find the right medication for a critically fragile population of patients. 
to your transcription errors. Every time I write something down and somebody has to rewrite what I did, there's the possibility they're going to write it wrong. Electronic ordering compound programs eliminated all errors of transcription. Fewer medical errors. CPOE almost completely eliminated medical errors with antineoplastic chemotherapy drugs. Toxic stuff. Don't want to make an error with somebody's chemo. No errors were noticed after the doctors got trained. That's pretty big. Saves money. Better care, lower cost. That was the second part of all this nonsense we're working through, right? Electronic medica medication management system was more effective and less expensive than paper-based prescribing. That goes back to the whole RAND study. If we start doing this digitally, we'll save money, but we can only do it if we get off of paper systems. Fewer prescription errors. CPOE with electronic medication alert system was associated with a decrease in overall prescription errors. You just get those calls from the pharmacist all the time. We can't figure out what you wrote. You'd see nurses in the hospital holding the chart up. And they'd, what do you think that guy wrote there? Is that 100 milligrams or 10? I don't know. But you hear the doc say, we should just go back to paper. God, it was just so much better on paper. Can we just go back to paper? And typically I have to say, no, they passed a law. You numb nut. You can't. But <laughs> truth is, it wasn't. The unintended shutdown of a long-running CPOE system revealed that physicians failed to write hand, handwrite flawless prescriptions. Electronic ordering with a complete and accurate OEF, alerts, clinical decision support, better than me writing something wrong on a piece of paper because I got the dose wrong or nobody could read it. And it's different for the next generation. My daughter, boyfriend, probable fiance if he gets on his knees and begs enough, um, <laughs> just started his third year of medical school. He's in his clinical rotations at, at um, K-State in Wichita. He's different. His generation's different. I'm really interested in watching the trajectory of his training and his career going forward. Because this generation of doctors don't have any memory of the DRGs. They don't have, I started medical school in 1983, the same year the DRGs came out. Oh my God, that was Armageddon at the time. The only thing that's come close to that since is meaningless use. <laughs> There's a whole generation. They don't have any memory of that. They don't know that. They won't grow up having ever used a piece of paper. They don't want to use a piece of paper. They're more satisfied using the computer. My daughter can type faster with her thumbs than I can with my ten fingers. They prefer this way. But not only that, they will grow up in a medical system that's paying attention to the quality that they're paying, and they'll understand why that's important. They'll grow up in a medical system that's paying attention to the cost of the care, and they'll understand why that's important. Because my generation doesn't. This generation will. It's a different group of people. My generation, we're going to retire and die and go away. But that's going to be another 10 to 20 years. So we need to understand who are we dealing with right now. We need to know who our clinicians are, who are using our system right now. And on the, this, you're right. You got this guy. He hates the EMR. Hates every single thing about the EMR. Neil Patterson has always said that the pen is the most dangerous item in the hospital. He's going to come down and he's going to stab you in the eye with it because he hates the <laughs> EMR so much. He takes time out of his very busy day to go to the IT department, to come to CPC, to come to CHE, to come to certain events, just so he can stand up and tell us how much he hates the EMR. On the other side of the bell curve, you got her. She gets it. She's all in. She might be the CMIO. She might be just an interested person. Maybe she runs Linux on a computer and she likes the command line and she likes EMR just because it's harder. I don't know. She's on board. <laughs> she comes to CHC and CPC in the IT department because she's interested in hearing what we have to say. Yeah, let's do this. Unfortunately, they're the two ends of the bell curve. The guy we're missing is the guy in the middle under the curve. He's upset. 
We established that already. He's irritated. Remember, he's disenfranchised, disgruntled, and dismayed. But he's not angry enough to take time out of seeing patients to come and yell at us. And he's not interested in taking time out of his day to go and hear what's going on. He's just, God, for Christ's sake, just give me a system that works. I don't care if it's Cerner, Epic, Next Gen, Athena, all scripts. I don't care what it is. You tell me I've got to do this, then give me a system that works. And that system's got to help me be a good doctor. It's got to help me make a good living. It's got to get me home in time for dinner because you've added a couple hours to my day. And if you provide me that system... I'm going to be great. It's going to be perfect. That's who we're building the system for. Unfortunately, we don't hear his voice. That's the guy we've got to figure out. We always have to keep that guy in mind because the angry guy is a squeaky wheel. And you know what? He just needs to ro- go retire or work someplace else. We can't really listen to him. And the lady on the left or the other side, you know, she'll do whatever we throw at her. She's happy to do whatever we throw at her. This is the guy that we're designing for right here, the guy under the curve. He's the one that every one of you goes to see when you're sick. We got to make it good for him. You'll hear people say that the EMR is just a tool. I don't think so. Doctors have tools. They got stethoscopes. They got scalpels. They got blood pressure cuffs. Those are tools. If you go into any doctor's office, there's a group of people, or hospital, there's a group of people who know things about the patient, who are paying attention to the patient, who are talking about the patient, making plans of care for that patient. The EMR knows things about the patient. It's paying attention to the patient 24 hours a day. It's telling us things about the patient that inform our care. The EMR is not a tool. The EMR is a member of the care team. It's become a person in the hospital. And it's not, the care team isn't just those people at the bottom in the pretty pastel scrubs and the white coats. The EMR is all of us. It's solution designers and it's architects. It's UI UX designers. It's usability testers, software engineers, IP strategists, clinical strategists, project managers, test analysts, research analysts. It's all of us. You may not feel like you're very close to what we do at Cerner, what we're about at Cerner. Chad over here. He's probably sitting there thinking, you know, I just, I just work on this. I told you I was going to pick on you. I, I just work on this little piece of code right over here. But that little piece of code takes you really close to the patients because the doctors and the nurses who use your system are counting on the fact that we're doing our jobs right. I'm a doctor, delivered babies for 22 years. Ben Wilkerson, you out there? He's a doctor, he's family practice, there he is. J.D. Tyler, hospitalist. J.D. Nolan over here, pathologist. (laughs) He doesn't really need the EMR because all his patients get to him just a little too late. (laughs) We're healthcare providers. Every single person in this room is part of the care team. Every single person who works at Cerner is responsible for the health of that member of the care team. Every single person in this auditorium, every single person who works at Cerner is therefore a health care provider. And I thought it was important you guys knew that. Thanks. Is there any questions? We got about one minute. They got this thing I get to throw at you if you got a question. Anybody? Oh, he's he's actually he's too far away. I was hoping somebody in the front row I could beam him with it. Yeah. Mike. Oh, there we go. Um, Okay, so that was an interesting talk. I've actually worked in the hospital um, prior to coming here. Granted, in like an ancillary role, but. I feel jazzed, I feel pumped. Let's make life better for doctors and the EMR. Make them better for nurses. And nurses. I'm a doctor, so I focused on my profession. But you know, I'm a team, you know, and if I'm making the plans, 
the nurses are carrying it out, and they're doing some of the nasty stuff. They're changing diapers. They're drawing blood. They're getting yelled at and thrown up on. I mean, they're, they're a critical part of that team, and the respiratory therapists and everybody else. So, it's, so take what I, everything I said, apply it to the whole industry. Go ahead. Sure. So I'm a code monkey. I, I type code all day long. What's the first step that I do, assuming I don't have any clinical background, to sort of gain EMR empathy? There are 105 doctors who work at Cerner. Bet you didn't know there was that many. Most of them work in the physician alignment org. There's about 40 of them, but there's 105 of us worldwide. If you want to understand the EMR empathy, reach out to us. We're more than happy to, if you don't understand why am I coding this thing, what is this little thing I'm doing, how is this snippet of code that I'm writing, this little thing, if you don't understand how that's going to change and what your effect is, reach out to us. We'll tell you. We're more than happy to tell you. We'll also tell you what the guys out in the field are saying so you can get the direct feedback. So you can look at it and say, I know we wrote it this way, but actually I heard from those docs that it should be done this way. And I think that's probably the first way yet is engage us. Like I said, there's 105 of us who work here. And um, we're here to help. We can't code. I don't know code. I mean, I, I, I came to DevCon. I couldn't go to most of your, I mean, <laughs> it's way over my head, most of the stuff. Although I saw some great stuff. I mainly hung out in the UI UX ones because they made sense to me. I don't understand your coding stuff. My job here, our job here is to help you understand our industry. We, we know the secret handshake for medicine. You know the secret handshake for software development. We have to talk to each other. Use us as the interpreter and that translator. That's it. It's 1 o'clock. We're done. Thanks a lot. <laughs>